The U.S. government now laying out its legal argument for killing American citizens overseas without a trial. But what about targeting people on U.S. soil? Can they now kill American citizens inside the country? The head of the FBI, when asked about that on Capitol Hill yesterday, stumbled around on this. Does that only apply to U.S. citizen that's overseas, or does that apply to U.S. citizen that's here? As well? I'd have to go back. I, I, uh, I, I'm not certain whether that was addressed or not. So that you, we have clarity here, he is not certain whether it was addressed, whether our government can kill our own people inside our own country. This really needs to be addressed? We can't just answer this question. No, the government doesn't kill our own people. We have a process for this. It's called the justice system. You file charges, you lock them up, you try them before a jury of their peers, and then that's how they don't kill our own people. Judge, you, the question is, can they kill our own citizens inside our own country? Well, the answer, this is a question we have to ask. It's, it's not a question that we should have to ask, and it's not a question that she, he should have evaded answering. I think he probably knows that the answer is no, but he doesn't want to frustrate his bosses who articulated just two days earlier that the answer is yes. Because at a speech on Tuesday at Northwestern University Law School, the Attorney General of the United States manifested extraordinary ignorance of the Constitution of the United States and suggested the President can kill anybody he wants outside the United States if that person is dangerous, if that person has committed crimes, and if it's impractical to arrest that person. Not in the opinion of a jury, but in the opinion of the president and some secret advisors. The Constitution says to the contrary. The Constitution says if the government wants your life or your liberty or your property, it has to articulate to a jury what law you have violated and prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt to that jury. It's called due process. Without due process, the government could take anything it wanted and kill anybody it wanted. And Attorney General Holder ought to know that. I suggest that Bob Mueller does. And the reason he evaded that answer is because he wants to keep his job. Well, you heard what Eric Holder said. He said there is due process, but there is not due juris something or other. Judicial process. Not judicial process. What the Attorney what? General said, let me make his argument. His, yeah, argument, his argument is that there is a substituted form of due process that if the president and his advisors carefully consider the danger of a human being and conclude that that human being needs to be stopped before that person causes any more danger, then the president can kill him. That's their argument. There is no case law that stands for that. There is no statute that authorizes it. And it directly defies the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Sounds like a crime against humanity. What's the difference between that and what Bashar al-Assad is doing to his own people? What is the difference? Nothing. What's the difference between killing somebody, an American with a drone in, in Yemen and killing an American with a drone in Peoria? Nothing. Right. The same argument that Eric Holder made at the uh, Northwestern Law School on Tuesday uh, about uh, Al-Awlaki in Yemen could be made about somebody in Peoria tomorrow. You make an illegal lane change in Hollywood on the 101 freeway and a drone will just shoot you out of the sky and throw you, you know, bury you. Well, I don't know that it's going to I don't, I don't know either, but who'd have thought we'd ever that. get to here? Who, who would have thought that we'd even be having a conversation like this? That the attorney, that the head of the FBI would hesitate to answer a question that is so imbued in our history and our law and our values, due process precedes punishment, that he can't answer that in public. And we're worried about contraception. Uh, uh, correct. Correct. We do not have our priorities straight. The last time the federal government claimed that it could kill Americans was in the Civil War. And even Lincoln said it could only be done in during combat. This federal government, this administration, says it can kill Americans when they're riding with their children in a car in a desert. I don't know, Judge. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep the following watching. video details contents of Army Document FM 3-39.40 titled Internment and Resettlement Operations. This document has been signed by Joyce E. Morrow, which is the Administrator Assistant of the U.S. Army. This document is 325 pages long and starts on page 38, showing that it applies to U.S. citizens within U.S. territory. On page 38, it clearly states the detainment of citizens of the United States of America within the territory and according to the categories of individuals uh, primarily DCs to be housed in IR facilities. On page 146 of this document, it addresses the detainment of U.S. citizens under the identification of prisoners section. It states that the first, last name, and middle initial must be put on the first line. 
and that the prisoner's social security number must also be taken. Prisoners are giving a registration number. Two profile pictures are taken from the front and fingerprints are taken according to AR 190-47. Included in these operations are organizations such as the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, and the United Nations. On page 56, it states the duties of the Psychological Operations Officer, which identifies trained agitators and political leaders within the facility who may try to organize resistance or create disturbances, to develop and execute indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes, identifies political activists. On page 281, it goes into even more detail on how these PSYOPs are used to pacify the population and to ensure cooperation. Now on page 238, it gets into the conditions for the use of deadly force in the camps. And some of the justifications for the lethal force include to terminate an active escape attempt. Now that right there should show you that this isn't no peaceful, loving um, camp that they're sending you to to um, rehabilitate and to get well. If you try to escape, they will use deadly force to terminate you, uh, is how they put it. On page 244, it calls for the use of snipers during riots to, quote, scan the crowds for agitators and political riot leaders and fire lethal rounds if warranted. So they are used to scan these crowds, and if they think that you are a leader causing these riots in this crowd or agitating it, they can kill you. Now on page 260, it shows the basic layout for one of these camps. It depicts a tribunal area, uh, holding areas, interrogation areas, and mortuaries. Each facility is designed to hold around 4,000 prisoners. Multiple layers of barbed wire wrap several of the internal compartments, and they also double wrap the outside of the whole facility, and it is protected by 24 guard watchtowers. On page 261, it depicts a civilian resettlement facility, which are designed to house 8,000 people. These facilities come with double barbed wire fencing around it with 16 guard towers of its own. Page 262, it shows us what the layout is for the facilities for non-compliant prisoners designed to hold up to 300 prisoners with interrogation centers and is guarded by 13 guard towers. Now, there shouldn't be any question as to validity of some of these camps because we've seen them. Um, every camp is different. They are all across the United States, and the more you know, the better your chances of survival are. Uh, that's why we put this information out there in hopes that you share it with your friends, your family, with military, with uh, people that are inside the police force within your town, within your community. Just to put these facts out there, uh, these are downloads. I'll leave you links. They come from transcripts from official Army documents that show the layout of these facilities. And if that wasn't enough, they are even on GoArmy.com. They are putting up ads for jobs for these positions, which I will show you here in a moment. And as we look at GoArmy.com, we see since 2009 they have been posting uh, spots for these positions. And currently, right now, they're still hiring. Internment Resettlement Specialist, 31E. And it also has an overview of the job duties. And you will have supervision of confinement and detention operations, external security to facilities, counseling and guidance to individual prisoners within a rehabilitative program, uh, records of prisoners and internees and their programs. Keep in mind this was drawn up in 2010 and it was just recently leaked and this is pre-NDAA, so before the National Defense Authorization Act this was drawn up, and you will have a tribunal of people which you do not even know within this camp decide your fate and your future. Shout-outs to Storm Clouds Gathering for their work on this, 
and they're passionate about this, and so am I. And if you are, uh, you can share this with your friends, family, uh, military, police, everyone in your community, uh, all over Facebook, YouTube. Get the word out there. Let the people know this is real. This is what's going on. And um, spread the word. Knowledge is power. wondering whether the senator is familiar with the fact that the language the language which precluded the application of section 1031 to American citizens was in the bill that we originally approved in the Armed Services Committee and the administration asked us to remove the language which says that US citizens and lawful residents would not be subject to this section. Is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration that asked us to remove the very language which we had in the bill which passed the committee and that we removed it at the request of the administration that would have said the app that this determination would not apply to U.S. citizens and lawful residents? I'm just wondering, is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration which asked us to remove the very language the absence of which is now objected to by the senator from Illinois. I, I'm familiar now because the senator from Michigan has shared that fact with me. When Congress refuses to act, and as a result hurts our economy and puts our people at risk, then I have an obligation as president to do what I can without them.